Hey, and welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, I'm your host, Sadia Engster, and this is Jewish Boy Calls His Mother. Hello, Ima. Hello. How are you? Good, good, good. How was your day? Hey, Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. Okay. Yes. It was a nice day here in New Jersey. Looking forward to going <laughs> back to 80 degree weather in Florida. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely getting a little colder. I don't know, I like that. I like the seasons. So um, this topic was actually given to me by Etsy, uh, my mm-hmm. sister, in case anyone's wondering. And she was saying that she remembers us all growing up, you know, in the house. And how would it be like if it was COVID-19 and it was back in 1994 and we had to get <laughs> stuff done? Uh my God. For, for, for those of you listeners who want to know, um, my parents are amazing people who have done amazing things. And to give an example of that, uh, we grew up in a three bedroom house um, in Baltimore. And by we, I mean me and my nine siblings. Um, it was definitely, I loved it. I, I personally felt it was like an adventure every day. I personally have a little social anxiety when I'm alone because I'm so used to so many people being around. Um, But it was just for me, in in my mind, I thought it was a lot of fun. But I guess growing up in that situation, some people might find it stressful. Um, Like I was explaining to uh, my girlfriend, she was wondering about like, you know, um, I I told her a story about how, you know, Ima, um, the girls would help my help to get dressed where he would they should they would pick up the clothes from the night before and they would the, the closet though was in my room so they would open up the door flick on the light get the rummage through the closet and then close turn off the light and i was telling uh, my girlfriend about that and she asked me like wait, wait where did you put your clothes <laughs> and i was like oh yeah i had like giant tubs i used to put my clothes in giant tubs that's how i would live there that's what I, that's what i would do and it's kind of funny because it's like of course we would joke around like we were struggling quote unquote i mean we were but it's just, it just it didn't it didn't feel that way because we all kind of had a very positive attitude to life we all kind of felt that like it, it, it's so much the story the old specific story about uh Reb, was it Zusha? no not zusha of Anapoli. yeah yeah Reb zusha of Anapoli. this is a this is an old jewish story about uh, struggle, I, mean, I think if anyone's struggling like everybody in this world, especially now, um, it'll be a good little story to take home with you. Uh, Rabzusha of Anapoli uh, was a very simple Jew, and he was a chassid. He was a follower, I think, of the Baal Shem Tov. Am I right? Actually, Al Rebbe. He was the a chassid of the Alter Rebbe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the Alter Rebbe. So the Alter Rebbe is a Rebbe mm-hmm. in Lubavitch. Um, you can look it up. It's very, very complex, very interesting. But a, uh, a man went to the Alter Rebbe and was telling him about his woes and about all his struggles and all of his tribulations. And the Alter Rebbe said to go to Zusha of Anapoli and he will give him direction. And he traveled to Zusha. To Zusha. He was located in Anapoli. That's why his name is Zusha Anapoli. And basically... He visited him, and Zusha Anapoli lived in a very simple hut with just a board and uh, a table for, you know, for, for learning and things like that, and for food. Very, very simply, very, very barren. Um, and he was, he always lived like, like we, was, we would say paycheck to paycheck, but what it, what it wasn't even that. And he saw him and he asked, uh, this man asked Rav Zusha Anapoli, you know, tell me about how to handle suffering. And Rav Zusha Anapoli looked at him and said, I don't understand because I, I've never suffered in my life. And it's about, it's about perspective. It's about like, you can have everything in the world. And if your mind is based on negativity where you have to feel like you need to suffer, you know, you're going to be suffering, but you could have everything you, you, you need and you won't suffer at all. You know, it's, it's well, I mean, for me now, I, I'm a little worried because it's, you know, because of COVID and because of unemployment and getting another job and whatnot. It's, it's, it's a little nerve wracking. And I'm also about to take my exams. But 
I have to just realize that it's going to be okay. You know, like I, I, well, like I told you kids um, when you guys were growing up, yeah, like I said, a bunch of, thank God, a bunch of kids in a little house. I said, look on the bright side. You can live here. You can live anywhere. Yep. Yep. A hundred percent. And that's kind of where like, in a way I, I, I like, I feel like I can handle everything because I've dealt with so much from before that if I could handle all that, I can handle this. Like, it won't be that such a big of a deal. Like, it doesn't really matter. You asked about, like, what would have, you know, what would have it have been like had, God forbid, the COVID-19 situation um, occurred when, you know, when I was raising all you guys you know, years and years ago in the 1980s and 1990s. And um, to quote my mother, my mother always said, this is why I don't have guns in the house. Oh wow! It would just, yeah, I mean, it would be stressful. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I, I remember speaking to some people, and they were like, "That one, this one person I knew, uh, you know, didn't want to have kids." And they they always would say, "If I had kids, you'd see the, uh, you'd, if the, them in the bathtub and me in the oven." <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, but as far as like you're talking about like um, putting up with, you know, not putting up with, or you know, meeting meeting challenging situations. That's a good way to put it, meeting challenging situations. I always keep a perspective. I think of what the Jews went through during the Holocaust. And well, I mean, you know, what we're going through now with COVID-19 compared to that, we're in kindergarten. We don't even come close to, um, to it, you know, their kind of challenging situation. So, you keep that perspective. <laughs> Basically, it's, it's the old adage. It's it's the old old adage. It could be worse. <laughs> it's it's like it's. And then I think I remember listening re, uh, reading a, a Calvin and Hobbes comic, where someone says that to Calvin, and Calvin screams back, "Well, it could be a lot better too." <laughs> well, I'll tell you a funny story. Um, uh, you you know your father, um for a few years was unemployed. And um, when he first, you know, when we first found ourselves in that situation, um, he had no job to go to and we had very little money and I'm sitting next to him in the house. And I took a deep breath and said to him, well, let's look on the bright side. And he says to me, what bright side? And I said to him, the only way from, from here financially is up. Yep. Uh, yep. He, was not, he was not amused. He was not amused. <laughs> uh, yeah, with, with, with Tati, you always had to have a certain certain set of timing with the humor, and he'll love it. It had to be the right timing, the right timing. Where, like, it was, I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 I always knew how to, some, some times I always knew how to, like, make Tati laugh and make, crack the right joke at the right time whatnot but yeah it's it, i think also it's like you think about the technology nowadays and the technology beforehand like how would how it how how did they handle school back in like dur- during spanish flu okay compared well, to like now but i um or, I or even night in the 90s i would think it would have happened because we're talking about it. it was with you um i think it was one of your sisters or might it might have been you was reading a historical fiction book based on actual events in 1918 during the Spanish flu. And it took place in um, upstate New York, in a small town, upstate New York. Um, what they did was they, they closed the schools and they also um, had everybody wear masks. So what did they do with and the wash, And wash their hands a lot, washing their hands. In fact, my, my mother recalls, my mother was born in 1918 during the Spanish flu. And she remembers growing up, she says her mother was a fanatic about always washing your hands. I think oh, that's where we get it from. That's where we get it from, from you. Oh my goodness. It's all because of the Spanish flu. That's funny. Well, no, no, you don't get it from me from the, because of the Spanish flu. What happened with us, the reason I became a fanatic hand washer years ago was we went through a period of time in the family where we were, your kids were always coming down with something. 
you were, it, get, it got to the point where I told the doctor, why don't I just keep one of those great big 10 gallon bottles of a pink amoxicillin in my kitchen and just give it to my kids every day. That's how bad it was. And then one day my nurse midwife said to me something very simple. She says, she was concerned, it was after you were born. Remember you were born, you had strep on your on your skin and they of were very I remember when I was born. Oh, no, <laughs> I didn't mean like, of course I mean like that way, but no, 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 I know, I know. <laughs> but anyway, that's right. You wouldn't remember. <laughs> uh, it's it's a okay. Bad, I, a bad memory. What do you mean you don't remember? It's a, collo- it's a colloquialism. It's a colloquialism. It's just something you say. <laughs> so, um, like happy birthday. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so they put you in the intensive care nurse room on um, antibiotics. And she said to me that she was very, very concerned about the level of infection that was in our house, she says to me, when people come into the house, when the children come home from school, when your husband comes home from work, when you come in from shopping, do you all immediately wash your hands? I said, no. So she said to me, start to do that. So I instituted that. Anyone who came to the house, you know, whoever they were, and the kids coming home from school, your father coming home from work, me coming in from shopping, no matter what, the minute somebody went outside, Came inside, the kids came inside from play, right away, sink, wash your hands, soap and water. And the level of infection in our house, wow, shot way, way down. It was a miracle. (laughs) Wow. No miracle was killing germs. I actually actually have a question. I have a question about that when it comes to like what 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 states a miracle? What because you know what happened, therefore it's no longer a miracle. A miracle you have to have some kind of mystery to it. Like miracle. Like and that's the thing. It's, it's it's like, okay, you understand it. All right, so that's kind of cool though. It's still pretty interesting. It's still amazing and phenomenal about that. Like, can't we just appreciate the, the simple and the mundane? Like, is that possible? Is that something we can do? I guess I guess you would have to say a miracle is something that defies nature. Oh, uh, or maybe it rises <laughs> above nature. Yeah, that would have to be a miracle. That would have to define a miracle. That would define a miracle. A miracle that kind of, Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's like, hold on a second. Give me a second. I'm trying to gather my thoughts here. Um, okay. So that would, it would be, well, it would be like COVID-19 going away quicker than they expected. Oh, my God. Sorry. The people are, they're, they're, they're saying that, that they won't have a vaccine. I thought February, but they're going to say like July. It's, I would, I, well, I asked, um, somebody in the medical field that like with most viruses, most viruses, if you do your best to deny them a human host, eventual and you quarantine, eventually they just fuzzle out usually within a year or two. So I asked somebody, this isn't, you know, this can't go on forever. If we continue to, you know, put on masks and be very careful and watch our, watch our social distancing and everything, will this thing just eventually have to fuzzle up because it'll be denied a human host? And this medical person told me, unfortunately, no, that this is an unusual virus because it was manufactured. Oh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's not a natural. Yeah. This oh, is what wow. The, so this is what this medical person said. That's interesting. What, 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 what was their, um, what, what, what was their like criteria, I guess, criteria is the word i'm looking for like what's what was their uh, basically what they had read oh, what they've read oh as, as a professional um okay so it's, um i don't know them you know that's, that's the I, there's, there's so, there's so many unknowns about. about this thing yeah that's the reason because it's um this this like i said this is not this is like i said this is a this is a medical unknown at this point yeah looking at it like it would be so stressful growing up with this as a kid in the house it would be so stressful like realizing now like i'm lucky enough to go ahead and like handle the situation by like not only by myself and like, my girlfriend but like like as an adult you know with the technology of today because it would just it would be such a struggle especially when it comes to school because like as soon as the schools get hit with something they shut down like TA, the, the boys' high school here in, here in Pikesville, like, ha, I think 12th grade, 11th grade, 10th, and 10th grade all got shut down within the first week of opening. Mm-hmm. And it's just, it, it's people, people are getting fed up. It's just, it's kind of funny, like, where you look back, like, 
did people get this like stir crazy back in the day? But I don't think they even had that, that those kind of regulations. I don't think they had six feet distances, lock everything up, quarantine. Like, I don't know. I, 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 I didn't, I'll be honest with you. I didn't read that much. I don't, I don't care. I really don't. Cause it doesn't matter to you. It's, it's, it's hard to compare because there's so many factors coming in. But mm-hmm. what I could say now is that people are, get, are definitely getting, getting, getting irritable, definitely getting a little antsy and they just want things to go back to normal, but whatever it's, it's, it's part of the deal. It's part of the life. It's just, it's, I feel like it's been talked about for forever. It's kind of why I didn't want to really have this conversation uh, topic because it's just, it's just been done before COVID-19, COVID-19, COVID-19. Mm-hmm. And like, imagine when we were kids, it'd be stressful. It'd be annoying. It'd be, it'd be terrible. It'd be way worse than, than ever. Like it would just be so frustrating. Um, you know, that we're, lo- we're lucky. We're really lucky right now to have COVID now than we, than if we had COVID when we were younger, hundred percent, we were lucky. I feel, I feel sorry. I'll tell you, I feel sorry for families with, you know, um, worry families with especially young children. It's, um, I'm sure it's not easy for them. Although there are some women I've spoken to who have told me that, um, ironically, that they and their kids have, I, I hate to say enjoy it because this is, you know, it's nothing to be enjoyed, but they said that they have found not having to rush off to school, not having to get the kids up, hurry, come on, come on, hurry, 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 but to be able to take their time in the morning. And that these mothers, you know, who told me that they found like a whole new, I guess, frontier of enjoying their children they come up with all sorts of wonderful activities for them to do. They've been learning together and reading together. And, um, you know, I've, I've actually spoken to some mothers who the effect has actually been just the opposite. And quite honestly, what's going to be interesting is um, the face of American society, uh, of our modern society in general. After this whole thing is over, I think, first of all, there are certain cleanliness habits that we are still going to keep. Um, I think we're all going to be fanatics about washing our hands and about wiping things down. And what occurred to me is like, when I go to, I think back sometimes to when I, before all this started, when I went to the store and I'm almost horrified at some of the things I did, I would bring home packages, bring home cans, bring home bottles, all sorts of things. Who knew how many people had handled these things before I picked them up? And I would take them home like everyone does. And without thinking, open up the bottle of soda, tear open the package of potato chips, you know, open up the box of cereal. And who knows what was on those things. Now, even when all this thing, all this is over, I think a lot of people are going to be very careful to wash things off before they open them or take alcohol wipes or disinfectant wipes and wipe down boxes and wipe down packages before they even open them. Um, I think... Um, I think a lot of people are going to take a, a really close second look at our educational system and think, and think, my goodness, my child learned so much at home on the computer. Why rush them through getting up, going to school, you know, unless you're in a position where you have to go to work and you need the child out of the house. But I think a lot of people are going to take a good second look at um, computerized learning at home. And I think a lot of people who have been working from home on their computers are realizing how necessary is it for me to get in my car, commute, you know, a half an hour, 45 minutes to work, to sit on the computer uh, when I can be in the comfort of my home and do all this from my house. And the companies, I think companies are going to take also a good second look at their businesses and say, hey, if we don't, you know, why do we bother renting out space, paying for energy costs when our workforce can work very well from home on the computers? Yeah, that's why, like, I think that's what people are noticing anyways. Education can be scrutinized. And I think in a way, there's going to be a nice happy medium between teachers and students now where, you know, I saw this one meme where it was like, oh, it looks like it wasn't the teacher's fault that your kid was disruptive. You know, <laughs> like people are going to see, people are going to see the reality because the biggest, I, I could say the biggest thing that in education that no one ever sees is their child's class when the child's in class. And now we're going to get to really see how 
the teachers interact and how the kids interact. And I think there's going to be a lot more hands-on. I think that the generation of today that, that went, that's going through COVID and is going through the educational process, especially young, uh, young children, I think from the grades like one to five, because by sixth or sixth grade and seventh grade, I think it's, it's a little different, but they're definitely going to be a little more, the parents, I would think, logically speaking, would be more hands-on or also be more inclined to ask more, more appropriate questions or be more involved with the children's education. Um, There's something else too I thought of. The advantage of Zoom learning is if a kid is disruptive, all you have to do is push the mute button. (laughs) Wow, can can we come up with some technology like that for the classroom? (laughs) If a kid's talking or being disruptive, we can push some sort of mute buttons to shut them up. Well, yeah, they could. Pro- I mean, that would probably be very interesting. I'd be very curious to know what uh, what from me, my, my sister, who's a teacher, what what they're doing. I, I didn't bother asking her actually. I, sh- I could have asked her, but um, I didn't. Uh, and also, you were saying that like people cleaning. You were cleaning cans like all the time when we were growing up. To co- to, when we'd bring in cans cans to uh, to the house, and we'd open them up and make sure that you go ahead and, and clean, get rid of the crud. You know, well, stuff. Cans in general, I might, you know, um, I think it's always a good idea. It's, it's always been a lot of people um, were cleaning cans, you know, the tops of cans before opening them, um, you know, dec- for decades. But um, now it's other things also, too. I guess, you know, like I said before, you know, the bottles, the, you know, any non porous surface and, and the and as far as the bags and the boxes go, wiping them down with an alcohol wipe or a disinfectant wipe before you open them up. I think it would create, it'll definitely, definitely will create an OCD from people. Like, like basically not, not to the extent, but like, you know, people that survived, you know, the great depression were very stingy. Like as they got older, they saved a lot of stuff. They became hoarders. So I think, I wonder what's going to happen to people as a whole. Once the virus stops, there'll be such an OCD anyways. Like seeing somebody without a mask or being more than six feet away, from, less than six feet away from somebody or touching mm-hmm. someone. Mm-hmm. There'll be like little like freakouts for like a while before like people can calm down. Well, your Aunt Judy mentioned something to me, which made a lot of sense. She said, you know, wearing masks all of a sudden hit her with a certain reality. She thought how she thought to herself, how often have I had a cold? I was coughing. I was sneezing. And I went out in public. Who knows who I gave that cold to? And she says, it makes sense if you have a cold, you know, even after this whole virus thing is over, if you have a cold, put on a mask if you go out to, you know, shopping or to the store or to school. That would make a lot of sense. Yeah, I think I think there will be probably. I, I mean, yeah, there, there, I think there would there would be some kind of regulation or some kind of common courtesy more than regulation that would be like. It would be it'd be a social thing, kind of like what happened to the Redskins. You know, it just became such a social issue that people just started doing on their own. Hmm. You know, and I think that's what that would probably be happening. Yeah. It'll be it'll be a better world once this whole horrible thing is over. Yeah, whatever. That's what everyone's saying. It'll be fine. Um, But all right. So this is the end of the show. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. Thank you, Emos, so much for, for, for joining me. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Love you. All right. Hugs and kisses. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions, please, you know, you can contact us, send us Facebook messages, figure this stuff out. Um, all right. Thank you so much, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Love you.